So I'm going to get started. Essentially, this talk is a little bit about what an SBOM is for those of us who are just beginning the journey. Uh, but it's also talking about the work we've done at the Eclipse Adoptium project. And the reason it's entitled How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the SBOM is we actually produce uh, a Timurin binary, an open JDK distribution. It's one of the largest distributions uh, out there. So we have a great burden of responsibility because we have, I think we've surpassed or we're at half a billion downloads now since the beginning of the project way back when we started five years ago. Um, that's a lot of people using the stuff we produce. Um, and so we take it quite seriously. And we want it to be proactive rather than reactive. We don't actually want threat actors, bad actors uh, coming for us. That then means everyone consuming what we produce is also at risk. So this is a bit of the story of what we're doing. Uh, so uh, what I'll hope to cover in this talk would be what's an SBOM, why you would want one, how you would get started, what we're doing at the project, and I t I'm going to talk quite a lot about that, and then some of the side effects of that. Uh, and I should say, before I dive right into this slide, I'm very bad at this kind of thing. My name is Shelley Lambert. <laughs> I work at Red Hat. Uh, I'm on the Adoptium uh, PMC and also in the working group uh, for the uh, project. Um, and I'm, I'll tell you a bit more about our project in a, in a little while, but just to know I'm actively working on our projects on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'm going to tell you that story from my perspective. But let's get started on what is an SBOM. The long-winded version of what it is is there. The complete, formally structured list of components, libraries, blah, 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 and are required to build your blah, blah, blah and the relationships between them. The analogy that many people use just because it's easy to explain in this way is it's the list of ingredients. Um, and from a perspective of a food analogy, you can have this kind of list of ingredients and you're looking at it so you can make sure you feel safe if you're about to eat the thing. So the analogy is not bad from a software perspective. So we're going to dive into that just a little bit. Uh, this actually, there's a wonderful set of materials. Highly recommend go checking out some of the explainer videos. This is the first one. And in this video, they're talking about uh, granola bar and how they look at that's their final good that they assemble. Uh, and then they want to send it out to an operator, the market they're going to sell it from, which then sends it out to consumers. But when you look at the list of ingredients for it, it's actually built from a set of component or compound parts, uh, and those compound parts can be broken down even further. So this granola bar had some salt and had some honey as individual units, but it also had oats, which could be broken down, and caramel, which could be broken down. So when we look at our Temerin binaries, the open JDK distribution that we um, distribute out of Eclipse Adoptium. We also can look at it in that same view um, and looking, our final good that we assemble is the Temerin binary. The operator or one of the operators for us is our Adoptium API. Of course, we also produce um, containers and publish them out of Docker Hub. We also have installers and uh, make those available through another distribution channel. But for the purpose of what I'll talk about today, I'm just saying, OK, we have lots of distribution channels, so several places in the operator column, and a lot of consumers of all of those. When we look at the compound parts for us, uh, we are building inside Docker containers for many of the platforms. I don't know if you were at the panel uh, yesterday, but we have one of the largest sets of platforms that we build and uh, distribute uh, out of the project. So in some cases, we can't build inside a Docker container. And we use Ansible playbooks to set up machines so that we can 
have an environment that's reproducible for us. And we pull the OpenJDK uh, source code. We use some of our build scripts that we keep in GitHub repositories in our uh, organization. And all of those can actually be broken down into many, 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 many individual parts. And we're in the process of taking a deep look at that. So there's, let's say for the purpose of this talk, uh, more than 100 different individual parts in that uh, first column. Uh, I will mention that uh, in an SBOM, that bill of materials, the list of ingredients, there are some minimum contents that we should be putting in, the, in there. So for example, uh, where we are getting our compound parts, those suppliers, we want to make sure all of the information is there um, and the unique identifier, the SHAs, if we're pulling from GitHub repos and that kind of thing. Uh, but now, what's the purpose? Why? The, to answer the question, why would we want an SBOM? Why would you want an SBOM? Why would anyone want an SBOM? <laughs> the, the first one, of course, is security. And if we've all been duly scared by uh, Mikhail's talk and the threats that are out there, um, this is probably one of the most important reasons to have an SBOM for the things you're producing so you can scan for vulnerabilities, so you can act quickly when vulnerabilities happen. Not if they happen, they'll always be happening. Uh, so we have to make sure we're in that mental state, that uh, notion that we are ready, as ready as we're going to be. Informational, uh, this is a neat, also good purpose for an SBOM, and this is really, you can track dependencies not just to look for if they're secure or not, but also um, to see if you're in a company or organization that has lots of different things you're producing, are they all using, what are your top three components that you're using, and especially if you're pulling in open source software. What's the top three? Maybe you should be investing in that open source project because it's so important to your organization. Or uh, perhaps it's even related to procurement. Do you need to change suppliers because of what you can uh, tell from your SBOMs? And then for us, and I think soon for a lot of people, purpose of an SBOM can be an artifact that we use for reproducibility. So can you reproduce your build and can you use this artifact as the recipe for it? Uh, and really just a visual view of this. If, <laughs> if I was going to show you that JSON file that had the hundred or more different individual components, it would not be very nice to read, human readable for anyone. I do want to say there's lots of tools being built these days that make it more uh, consumable for people to look at. So know that as you're building your SBOM, you don't have to consume it in this flat file that's very hard to read. There's going to be a lot of tools coming. This is uh, the bomb doctor from, I think, Sonotype, but a lot of tools that are gonna be able to read the at least the top three standardized formats for SBOMs and present them in a way that's helpful for humans. So the use case of the track dependencies and the scan vulnerabilities, you're going to use those tools. For uh, the use case of reproducible builds, um, I just wanted to show kind of a very simplified view. When we initially run a build, we're pulling from our uh, source code repository, we're sending it to a CI CD system, we're creating our artifact, and alongside that artifact, that bill of materials. When we think about consuming that artifact called a bill of materials or an SBOM. You can use it for observing, archiving, checking licenses and compliance, and probably if you've seen Wayne Beaton's talk on the Dash uh, licensing system, that's an SBOM that's specifically for the intellectual property and licensing pieces. Again, you can have SBOMs for different purposes. You could blend it all into one. I'm not going to go into detail about those choices are probably project specific. For us, we've added number six, that why would I want it for reproducibility? So could we take an SBOM, that artifact, 
and bring it back, feed it to our pipeline, and produce the same artifact. Quick note about those uh, storage form the specifications where you can say, I'm going to use this type of JSON file. There are big three, SPDX, which I think is what's being used by the Dash tool. Um, its original purpose or focus was for licensing. Um, the SWID tool, I think, actually predates all of them. Um, and then Cyclone DX, which is a fairly new uh, to the scene, but its original focus is security. Does it matter what you choose if you're saying, what, what kind of SBOM do I need? No, I don't think it does. <laughs> I actually think that we're in an evolving space. There's lots of associated tools. Eventually, you'll create, choose whatever you're comfortable with working in, and then later, there's going to be a tool that's going to translate into any format that you need. So I, don't, I wouldn't spend a long time worrying about this piece. OK, so we're getting into what we do at the project. First of all, what is the project? <laughs> Eclipse Adoptium is the top level project, but underneath it, we have a lot of sub projects. And Temerin is the sub project where we build and distribute these JDK binaries to millions of people, millions of consumers. Um, the other projects are very cool and interesting as well. I won't have time to talk about them today. Uh, but I will say very quickly some of the ones that are uh, kind of big and important and no one knows about uh, Aquavit, the quality project, the project we test for quality. So when we're uh, building and distributing timber and binaries, we also test the out of it. Um, and we built it in such a way that anyone can pick up and use the quality assurance stuff out of that project. So it's not just for Tamarin binaries, it's for any binaries. Can we raise the bar of quality across the board in the ecosystem? Um, and uh, Tamarin compliance, kind of also interesting. Uh, the test for compliance is your uh, binary, uh, is the Tamarin binary uh, compliant with the Java specification. And then a lot of really cool stuff in here as well. We've got people at the back of the room that you can ask questions. All of these projects are very good. So in very, very small writing, where do you get your Java? <laughs> uh, so work at Adoptium. For this talk, we're talking now about the Trusted Software Initiative. And we've got all the acronyms. <laughs> if you're aware of some of these, great. If you're not, I'm going to explain very quickly what they are. Um, and if you were just at uh, Mikhail's talk, you'll also recognize this diagram, a very simplified version of your, the supply chain and where all are all the places you can be attacked. Uh, <laughs> so uh, again, it, if you kind of think about it from this perspective, you are going to be sweating. You're going to be uh, staying up at night. I can assure you that the way you deal with this is by starting to do things. And you don't have to solve all your problems all at once. Incrementally, you're going to um, begin, and you're going to start seeing that as you're creating an SBOM, as you're starting to think about this stuff, um, you become less and less worried by doing. All right. OK, so SSDF. We, uh, before uh, Eclipse Foundation even began the salsa work, we had already decided proactively we were going to take this NIST framework, uh, so from the US government. We were going to take it and apply it to our project. Uh, there's details there and our tracker for what, where we're at going through the checklist provided by this framework. But essentially, it's four top-level pieces. Uh, prepare the organization, protect the software, produce well-secured software, and then continuously assessing, prioritizing, and remediating vulnerabilities. So there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, we have been going through all of these pieces. And for us, because we were uh, super smart and automating everything from the beginning. Some of this is actually uh, more of a documentation exercise. 
document what we're doing to show that, yes, good, we're following this framework. And in other cases, there are actions we need to take as well. That SALSA, what does it stand for? Uh, supply chain levels for software artifacts. Um, and that's the table that Mikhail shared in his presentation. If you weren't there, watch the recording. Um, this is our checklist and where we're at. We're currently sitting at level two and within, I think within the month, but probably before the end of the year, uh, we'll have achieved level three of the four levels of SALSA, which means we're hitting all of these check marks in this third column. We actually have a bunch of the check marks in the fourth column, the highest level uh, that SALSA has. But of course, there are a few pieces that are going to be challenging. You see that piece, reproducible builds, um, and there's a little circle. That means when possible, or you have to explain why it's not possible. Um, our Tamarin SBOM, so actually back to here, I think I had said we have all the acronyms, so I just wanted to quickly note the two there are frameworks that you use to help you, you and your project get better at things, and the SBOM is needed by both frameworks, so kind of a good place to start, because it doesn't matter what framework you're using, to get better at being secure, um, but find the commonalities. We've done the mapping to say, good, mostly it's all the same activities. It's just a different checklist uh, in a different order. So our uh, current Tamarin SBOM is being served up out of our API alongside the binaries. I think we're one of the only uh, distributions that provide an SBOM. So, uh, <laughs> and right now we're using, we chose Cyclone DX as the format we're going to use in this beginning stages, um, and it's a big long JSON file, and it contains the baseline component information. And so that's just an example of if you wanted to pull the SBOM for JDK 17, x64 Linux, that's the URL you'd go to, swap out any of the you know, you want for eight, you want for 11, you want for 20. Uh, if you're getting JDK 20 from our uh, location, you're not getting a GA version, you're getting the EA, which we produce nightly as well. You can always pull the SBOM from anything we build. It's part of the automated build process we have. But are we happy with the contents of our SBOM? Not quite. Because remember, we said we want to use the SBOM for reproducibility. We also want to make sure we're covering everything um, where you say, I have dependencies, and they, our dependencies have dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies. We're drilling down completely as low as, mm, very low <laughs> into this. Uh, we're using strace. We're trying to make sense of it. So what do I mean by making sense of it? There's everything that touches our build and affects, could potentially insert something or affect our build. And then there's everything that's in this list that matters to reproducibility. So it's actually a shorter list. The long full list is there for us to track dependencies and scan for vulnerabilities. The subset of the list is there for us to know if that changed, that affects reproducibility. And for us, that matters as well. Uh, and I will also say, why do we care to have a reproducible build? I wonder if I did this correctly. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about um, you know, some of the jobs we have. So if I want to be able to build from an SBOM, that's my little config view in Jenkins. Send me, show me where the SBOM is, I'll take it, and I'll build with it. And in fact, I don't really need the platform there because it contains it within the SBOM. But uh, click on that, and it runs and produces a Timurin binary. The reproducible build story from the perspective of an SBOM. Um, what if I just put anything in the SBOM? You'd have to trust that I 
I, me. <laughs> and I'm not sure you necessarily need to trust me. You can trust but verify. So reproducibility means you can take it and build it within your own shop. And we've gotten to the point where they're bite for bite identical. So you can say, I took your SBOM, I built it on my hardware, not open source uh, location. I trust my team, my hardware, my insight. Um, and in fact, I got Microsoft, I got Red Hat, I got IBM, I got Azul, I got all of our partners and members at the project to do the same. And they all said, yeah, I'm bite for bite identical with this open source thing that you're building. We're good. That means the chance of someone having inserted something bad has, is probably a lot more reduced. Um, and so where are we at with this work? And please go read that blog post. It tells all about it and all of the upstream changes to OpenJDK that were needed to get us to the point of reproducibility. Um, Linux and Mac for uh, 17 and 19 plus, uh, we are byte for byte identical. We can reproduce the build. Work in progress on Windows, I think we'll be there likely by end of first quarter 2023. So those are really covering most of our uh, platforms and architectures that we build at the project, which is a happy place. Back in that table where we saw the little circle for some of the uh, more challenging platforms uh, that we have that maybe uh, we're not gonna prioritize, that will be those exception cases. So if you need your Solaris Spark V9 or some of the other builds we produce out of the project, uh, those will likely not come quickly because this is where our core number of downloads are. Uh, and then we'll obviously at the project also have some tooling to make it easy for us to do that comparison. So point me at the thing that Red Hat built inside point me at a Tamron binary or point me at two Tamron binaries and we're going to run and check that they are identical. Uh, and you'll notice those exclude files. Hang on. What do you mean they're identical? What about this file? Um, what if I change the vendor information or what if I change something? Then we know there are three files out of the set of things that are produced that will be different. I maybe want to remove them from my diff when I do that comparison. Uh, okay, positive side effects. Well, as we go through this, it helps us continue to uh, have good hygiene at the project. It m allows us to more quickly produce builds and react when we have to re-spin builds. So the ease of maintenance at this very large and demanding project is kind of lightened. Um, it really does assist us in triaging and debugging issues because I can look and compare two SBOMs and say, oh, okay, these three things changed. Um, that isn't so easy when you're looking through console output um, and much easier when you have this artifact. And essentially, I think uh, SBOMs do raise the bar for software distribution. Um, because, and, and you'll find this as you're doing this in your own projects. If you, oh, probably all of you are already doing it, I don't know. Um, but it really does have an effect on the, on the team. It has an effect on uh, the confidence uh, and our speed of delivery. And so the other re um, positive side effect of us doing this is perhaps leading by example. So. If we can do it in uh, the complex thing that we're building, it's probably possible for uh, smaller projects or things that are, have less strange dependencies and uh, less uh, components to do it as well. Okay, and I don't know, I probably blazed through that. Um, but what I wanted to say here is that uh, in summary, the the what is, it's that list of ingredients. And the why is uh, because, because it's a good idea, right? Security, hygiene, all good. Important to note, I think the how is 
just incrementally. You don't have to do everything all at once. The very first SBOM you create can be make it, but have it have those compound parts. You didn't dig down. It's still hard to find all the dependencies of the dependencies. That's OK. Uh, you, you, if you don't start somewhere, you probably won't start. Um, and then I guess for the piece of what we're doing at the project, as mentioned with that S trace and uh, digging deeper, digging deeper, is we're just going to continuously refine what we do, but also build tools to make it easier for us to do the work we're doing. So those comparison tools. I think there's a whole piece also around, now we have the SBOM, um, and we can have this reproducible build story. How do we uh, use our collaborative minds and missions, you know, all the members of our working group, how do they want to leverage this um, artifact and leverage our security, our trusted software initiative for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the whole ecosystem? And then I guess that side effects and benefits, the main message actually is that uh, the stop, how, you know, how do you stop worrying and love the S-bomb? Well, the part, well, how I stopped worrying was by starting to do it, starting to do this work. Because when we hadn't started, it was scary and unknown how big of a piece of work this was. But then we started and it became clear that, okay, it's not, 10,000 components, it's 100. And it's not, so you start to get real numbers and real idea of the size of the work. And by putting that set, that boundary around it, um, allowed us to like, my hair stopped falling out. So that's really good. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I probably blasted through that. I'm not sure uh, if people have questions or want to ask things. But I actually kind of wanted to just find out where people were at in their own kind of journeys. Uh, or if you're consuming Tamarin, um, did you know we had an S-bomb? And would you have a notion of using it for your own purpose? So I'm going to open it up to questions. And yeah. And I'm supposed to walk this over to you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. But Carmen will also help here. Carmen, our community manager. Woo! <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, my, my question is, with respect to um, reproducibility, yeah, maybe not the right word, I'm sorry. Um, besides knowing exactly uh, the components you use, shouldn't you be tracking also uh, the compiler and the, that's the, one the, of the components, yeah. Yeah, okay, and yeah. the pipeline itself, because to get exact byte to byte uh, binaries, I guess the compiler version is important it as well. It matters a lot. Um, and the other thing, so that I didn't spend time on it in this talk, but uh, and kudos to Andrew Leonard, he's been kind of championing it from our uh, project pushing changes up to OpenJDK, but things like timestamps matter. Things like, so a lot of changes had to go into that upstream uh, repository to allow us to get to the point that we could have byte for byte comparable uh, things. Because it, it was not an original requirement of the upstream project. It was not, no, okay. yeah. <laughs> and I think it uh, boiled down to around 14 uh, different uh, pull requests that went into uh, JDK 19, and they've been backported to JDK 17. Not yet backported to 11 and 8, and I'm not sure if we're going to worry about that. Everyone should move forward anyway. <laughs> but yeah, good question. It does matter a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a, a Maven-based build, as many of us do, I guess. Yeah. Um, if I understand correctly, you, or what comes to my mind is creating an initial S-bomb by using a Maven plugin for that, yeah. which is based on the dependency tree that I'm building. However, based on the information you just gave, what should also be in there is probably the, the, the Java compiler that I'm actually using yeah. 
and the Maven version and, and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So, but, and, however, uh, that is usually not produced by these plugins, I guess. They basically only consider the dependency yeah, it's, tree. It's uh, upward. It, you, yeah. They're not, you're not, a lot of times they're not thinking about this kind of base component. However, uh, talking with folks from Maven Central, talking about whether or not they, could they enforce that everyone needs an SBOM? Could they? Uh, I, I think that there's a story, and I actually think some of our partners and people we're working with from these different companies that are thinking security all the time will be, what's the use case when I do want to say, and I also need that base level, the, the JDK I'm running on, I, know, I also want to know about that. Um, so, yes, when you're producing something, you're going to probably have a Maven story for your Java application. And if you're not uh, redistributing the actual JDK with it, you won't require it. But if you're running it across all of your uh, systems with inside your organization, you probably care. I guess the point of my question was more, so if I cr initially create the SBOM using such a plugin and then I amend it with additional information manually, I will end up in, a, in an SBOM that you, you, needs you, to be maintained manually. That's my biggest fear. Oh, okay, I have, see, yeah, yeah. There no, the, in fact, in for Cyclone DX, there's a way you can link off to an SBOM. So all you would need to do there is in the SBOM you've created, you create a link off to something. So that part you can automate. And then if, you're pull, if you've pulled the next version of Java or you keep in line with the release cadence of Java, then it's, you'll go latest JDK 17 mm -hmm. and link off to the SBOM. Yeah. So it's really, an SBOM doesn't have to be a single document. Yeah, it can okay. be a set of documents. And there's also that notion of VEX, so the piece that's going to let you know what uh, CVEs are being addressed by a particular build. And that's also kind of a, an artifact you link off to from the original SBOM. Mm -hmm. OK, thank yeah. you. And, and that's probably worthy of a blog post or a talk all on its own. So the, the user story of exactly your question, right? How do I handle that? What should I be doing? Yeah. Oh, here first and then. Yes, so you mentioned that you can use your SBOM for reproducible builds. Um, do you then also save the artifacts? Because in the previous talk about Maven Central, for example, they mentioned that versions with malware get removed. So even if you have your SBOM, but the upstream uh, version is gone, then you cannot no longer rebuild. Yeah, so every time we build, we keep the SBOM, so one of the tests. And I should say, this is still work in progress. That's the goal, to be able to use the SBOM to feed it into the system. We still would create a new SBOM and then compare the two, because really, they sh then should be identical. Although, as I mentioned, you know, that hundred set of uh, individual component parts, only some of them matter to reproducibility. So, uh, the, a subset of them. Some of the libraries and components, if you change them, wouldn't affect that reproducibility. So I could, and that's why the, right now we're in the middle of exhaustive S-trace experimentation. Of, of those 100, if I change one, how does it affect reproducibility? And if it doesn't, I'm still going to keep it in there because I need to track and scan for vulnerabilities. Um, so I could potentially pass an SBOM in that had some of those things that don't matter to reproducibility. Those still could change. So I still need to keep the new SBOM. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, that didn't really <laughs> answer whether you keep the artifacts or not. Yes. Well, well, okay. Yeah. So, so the, the, that SPOM, you know where we store our binaries for people to pick up is a releases repository. The SPOM gets pushed alongside those binaries and we keep them. Uh -huh. yeah. But those artifacts that you mentioned in the SBOM, are those saved? Because if one of those is important and it somehow disappears from the internet, yeah. You wouldn't be able to reproduce. Yeah, we'd be fadood, I think is the technical term. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you do not save them. Uh, we do in the sense that uh, we have now assessed things that 
Mm, there's a particular, for the Windows piece, for example, um, if we have a compiler uh, and we're using that, and we've noted that it's not just the version of the compiler that matters, it's like some of, there are other parts of it that matter, and I can't go back and fetch that somewhere. So we've noticed that that is the case. We have to have our own copy. We have to store our own copy of it. Yeah, so we are now going through the process of checking uh, every one of those things. And also, that should alert us to, hang on, if we can't, if that is a thing that is a base component and it's, going to go away on us. First of all, can we, could we remove it as a base component? And if it's not possible, we have to have it stored. Yeah. yeah. I think we had, yeah. And also, I don't know if you've lost your question as well. <laughs> we'll get to a new person. Yeah, OK, good. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, web front end development. And um, when I push something to GitHub, for example, they have some automatic security checking, which you also cited as a motivation for the S-bombs. But these um, security alerts, which I get, are 90-90% completely useless, because the way the dependencies are used um, never expose these errors. So I was wondering um, whether you are encountering the same problem in, in your use cases, and if, in general, the S-bombs can help solving this to get better errors. Yeah. And I will say, I should... Uh, I probably sounded super confident up here. <laughs> uh, but our, I think there's two things to note about that. One, um, I think our story is a little slightly different than a, s other people's um, stories in that we're, I'll say we're, right now in, in an SBOM, we would consider ourselves a library, and then that library has components in it. Um, do we have the problem of uh, actually getting these kind of false alerts? Not yet, uh, because we're not even, we're still a work in progress here, right? Um, do we have, uh, what was the second part of your question? Oh, uh, what I wanted to say was, I believe the tools are going to be getting better. I've seen it even over the last year that uh, right now, everyone's writing all the tools because this is hot, right? This is a hot topic. Uh, I'm going to have the best visualization tool to show you these vulnerabilities. Um, I'm going to be able to give you the most accurate information so I don't generate noise for you. Because really, if, if all that this is going to do is cause a flood of you should be worried, concern, concern, and not be smart about identifying where it's not actually a concern, then, then we, it really does go back to the uh, 1964 movie of uh, my, my tools are better than your tools and it's an escalation, rather than let's think about these as making the ecosystem better and trying to secure open source software. But did it answer your question? Yeah, I guess. So I yeah. was um, so just wondering, so is there some indication in the S-bomb on how a dependency is used? Oh, what's it say again? Um, is there some indication on how a dependency is used? So for example, is it a build-time dependency, a runtime dependency, and uh, yeah. what parts of it Yeah, used? so I, I don't know if you remember the slide that said the basic, a baseline component information. Um, in there, it mentions um, relationships. That section of a base component and its relationship to other things, that can capture some of what you're hoping to see in there. How is it used? What, what, why does it matter? Why is it in this document? Yeah. Yeah. Are we yes. time for escaping or are we? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah.